Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Ann, and I am uh, the Education Director with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. And we are so excited to be live this morning with our friend, Dr. Greg Skomel of the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. Want to say hi to everybody, Greg? Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Pretty excited. So this morning, we are going to do a live Q&A with Dr. Skomel, um, because we've had so many requests from people who want to learn more about, you know, how do they become a shark scientist? And, you know, what does a day in the life of a shark scientist look like? So we've been fortunate to feature some of our other friends. We had Fabian Cousteau a while back. We also had Hannah Med. Uh, but we're really excited today to bring in Dr. Greg Skomel uh, because here at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, we work collaboratively with Greg, who works for the Division of Marine Fisheries. And I think first off, Dr. Skomel, if you could explain to us a bit, you know, you are Dr. Greg Skomel uh, and you work with sharks. And for most of our young ones, when they hear that word doctor, they think of someone who works in a hospital or, you know, at the local health center. So can you explain, you know, how you got to where you are and how your career track as a shark doctor might be a little bit different than the medical doctor like we're seeing on TV right now? Yeah, the doctors that you're seeing on TV right now are real doctors and uh, they're doing one heck of a job. Um, I like to think of us as fake doctors um, with PhDs. And, you know, I don't even know if we should be called doctors, but what it means is that we you know, those of us who have a PhD actually have put a lot of time into our schooling to become uh, really good at what we do. And, uh, and it involves uh, a lot of studying. I know a lot of you guys see me out in the field, you know, on TV doing our research. And that's a real fun part of the job. But, you know, what you don't see is actually behind the scenes. You're getting a little taste of that today because you see me in my house. And, and uh, what happens during these off months is we're analyzing data and we're we're writing up that information, we're writing grants, and we're publishing peer-reviewed research papers, and, and, and it's, uh, it's kind of a, a really fun side of the job. But I got here because, uh, I, like many of you out there, I, I'm super interested in sharks and always have been since I was a young person. And uh, movies like Jaws and Blue Water, White Death are really fascinating to me. And I decided probably uh, right after the movie Jaws came out, I was in high school, uh, that I wanted to be a, uh, somebody who was a marine biologist and maybe even get a chance someday to study sharks. And so I went to the University of Rhode Island after I graduated from high school and I got an undergraduate degree and then I started volunteering, which I recommend a lot of people do because it really helped me out. I volunteered at the National Marine Fisheries Service shark tagging program in Narragansett, Rhode Island while I was finishing up my undergrad. And that led me to getting hired by them to become a technician. And I learned a lot from my mentors there, which included Jack Casey, Wes Pratt, Lisa Natanson, Nancy Kohler, great scientists, and uh, went on to be, get a master's degree so I can get more experience and, and learn how to become uh, a marine biologist. And, and then ultimately, I, I got a job working for the State Division of Marine Fisheries in the late 80s. So I'm not that young. <laughs> uh, and then I moved on. I, I, and it's never, it's a great lesson. It's never too late to go back to school because after working for the division for 10 years, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go for a PhD. So I went to the Boston University Marine Program, which in those days was in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And I lived out on Martha's Vineyard. So I used to commute over there and, and I got my PhD. So you can always go back to school. It's never too late. Um, and you can also take your time, you know, when you're deciding what you want to do. Um, so that, that's my course of, uh, <laughs> through my life. And it's really worked out well for me, and I absolutely love what I, what I do. That's great. Um, and can you explain to us a little bit? So, you know, I work over at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. We are a nonprofit organization, uh, but you work for the state. You work for the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. So what does that state department do? And, you know, we have viewers who are turning in from, um, you know, other states. We've got Pennsylvania, Texas, Maryland. You know, do those states have a division of marine fisheries or even in other countries? We've got some folks tuning in from Canada. Yeah, they, this, uh, that's a great question, Marianne. I think it, it's good to explain that. You know, every single state has environmental agencies that act as stewards for their resources, their natural resources. And, and if they're a coastal state, they, they generally have some marine related agency. In, in my state, Massachusetts, it's called the Division of Marine Fisheries. 
in Rhode Island. It's, it's called the Department of Environmental Management, but they have the same kind of job, and that is basically collect the kinds of information that we need to effectively manage our natural resources, our marine resources um, at sustainable levels. So that, that can involve uh, people doing basic research like I do, to folks that are involved in using that research to develop management plans for, for, uh, for sustainable harvest or catch and release. So uh, take an example like, uh, like, like striped bass. For many people who like to fish along the coastline of the, uh, the US, they love to target striped bass. It's a wonderful game fish. And you know that we have minimum sizes and bag limits in place in each of our states. And that's because, you know, we have decided that in order to, to have a sustainable population of striped bass, we have developed these regulations to achieve that. And that's what our agencies do. Um, and in other countries, they have fisheries agencies. You know, in, in the US, we have a, a federal agency called the National Marine Fisheries Service, which kind of oversees our federal waters, which extend from three miles out to 200 miles out. And in other countries, they have fisheries agencies as well. And, and, and we even get together with those agencies in other countries to talk about how we share resources. So fisheries uh, agencies are really important for sustainable harvest and sustainable management of our marine resources. And, uh, and that's what I like about my job because the information that we're collecting about white sharks or any other shark species goes directly into conservation sustainability. Great. Um, all right, so we have some questions coming in from viewers now. Um, and a lot of them have to do with, you know, you just mentioned how right now it's not your field season, you know, that a lot of your time isn't actually spent out on the water, but that's the exciting part of your job. Um, so a lot of people are asking questions, you know, looking at when does the field season start? When, you know, will the white sharks be back in this area? Um, as well as if you can explain kind of maybe that launching timeline for the season, because there's some also some questions coming in about the acoustic receivers that will come in. Um, and as you go over this, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put up a picture of that research boat uh, so folks can see this from home as you're talking about it. Very cool. Um, well, you know, obviously we have an unusual spring uh, going on right now. All of us are hunkered down but that doesn't mean our preparation for our field work isn't underway. Uh, we're purchasing equipment, we're designing um, our, our, our studies for this coming season, and we hope to kick things off like we normally do in mid-June. You know, a lot depends on obviously what happens with COVID-19 and our ability to get on the water in close proximity to others, and so that can all shift. But if all goes according to plan, uh, the sharks will begin showing up, um, most likely because we've had a relatively warm winter by late May, usually the last week in May, a couple will show up. It'll begin to ramp up in June and our big months are July, August, September, October, even into November before they start to leave again as waters cool down. So we want to be ready for them. And part of that is um, getting our acoustic receivers in the water. We now have over 100 acoustic receivers around the coastal waters of Massachusetts and, uh, and working with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy and, and our other partners, we try to, in towns and local cities, we try to get these out by the end of May. It doesn't always go that easily because we need to deploy each one of these receivers and, it's, uh, and it takes uh, quite a bit to do that. Um, but we will try to get them out by the end of May so that they're ready to detect any of our tag sharks that come back. And then we'll get on the boat ourselves, hopefully by mid to late June, and we'll work straight through into early November. So um, right now we're in the preparation stages of that. Okay. Um, and we've got some questions looking at the size of the sharks that you see, um, and especially, you know, what is the largest shark that you've seen there? So looking at this photo too, if you can explain to folks, when you're out there, it's not like you can take a tape measure and measure the sharks. So, you know, talk about the size of the sharks you're seeing and how you actually come up with that estimate of how big they are. Yeah, we use a couple of different methods to come up with the sizes of our sharks. And we've seen them as small as six or seven feet out there, but those are relatively rare. Those are juveniles and, and those, uh, those younger juveniles really don't wanna be around these bigger sharks. I would say our average size 
is somewhere you know around 11, 12 feet long. Um, and we get them up to about 18 feet. And, and the way we come up with these sizes, we use uh, uh, not only consensus on the boat. So there'll be Captain John King, myself, as well as Megan Winton from the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy on board. And she's their research scientist. And having seen so many of these sharks, we come up with a, a consensus as to what we think its size is to the nearest foot, even to a half foot if we feel very confident that day we've had a good look at it. But then we'll also compare that to photos like this one, um, which was taken by Wayne Davis. Wayne is photographing these sharks from the air. And we can use the scale of the boat or the pulpit of the boat on which I'm standing, or even the length of the tagging pole in my hand as a, um, uh, as a comparison to what we think the shark might be. And so we know the length of the boat, we know the length of the pulpit, we know the length of the tagging pole, and we can then use that as a scale to come up with the length of the shark to see how accurate we are with our own uh, guesstimate, if you will. So using those two methods, we come up with a pretty good uh, estimate of what we think those shark sizes are. Great. And I would like to point out for all the kids at home, that means, you know, when you're talking about scales, you're talking about math involved with all this, right? Math is definitely a component in the research. <laughs> Math is a major component in the research, and, and I'm hoping that, uh, that Megan's doing one of these talks as well, because math is, is half her world, and she's really good at it. And I, 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 I tell you kids out there, if you're interested in science, it's not just riding around on boats and, and seeing cool things. It's, it's knowing a lot about math and a lot of other disciplines. Excellent. All right, so we have some questions coming in about tagging. Um, so we actually have a video here. This is an older video, um, but it's gonna show, you know, you out there on the pulpit um, actually deploying that tag. And this is cell phone video for everyone at home. We're not always out there with a film crew like people see on TV. <laughs> but after we watch this video, so you just deployed that tag, maybe you can then explain to everyone. <laughs> yeah, that is a while ago, I think. It looks a little grainy. It's got to be cell phone. Um, yeah, yeah, that's our, that's our tagging technique. It's a little different from, um, from others that are used on, on sharks around the world. W one of the things we realize is we, because we're in such close proximity to swimming beaches, we're, we're not interested in chumming the water and attracting the sharks to us. We actually go to the sharks. And uh, what makes that really possible is, is using uh, our spotter pilot, Wayne Davis, who's able to find these sharks, will travel over to the sharks. John King is in the tower of the boat. When he sees the shark, then I'll see the shark. And once we get a good view of that shark, we'll get as much video of it as we can in a couple of minutes, because we want to know who that shark is. We want to know whether it's a male, a female, we want to get a better sense of its length. Um, and, and even identify whether we've seen that shark before based on color pattern. Um, and then once we've done that, I'll uh, swap out the, the GoPro on a pole for the tagging pole. And, and here it's just really excellent communication uh, between me and, and John King driving the boat. Um, and you know, once we have a good sense that that shark's high enough up in the water column, and it has to be high in the water column, um, we will then you know, come up on it and I'll try to place that tag at the very base of the dorsal fin um, in an area that it doesn't hurt the shark. And we use a really, really small intramuscular dart to do that. That's right on the end of that tagging pole on a small needle. And I'll pop that underneath the skin into the dorsal fin at the base and then the shark will take off. And it, and it really works well. And, and as a result, we've got over 200 sharks tagged you know, using this technique. And we're not capturing them, we're not, we're not lifting them out of the water, we're not hooking them in any way. We're trying to be as least invasive as possible because we don't want to impact or influence their behavior um, in any way. We want to study their natural behavior. Great. And when you were talking about that, you know, you kind of talked about the order of operations out there on the boat. Um, and you talked about how you get that underwater GoPro footage of the shark for ID purposes. Um, so this video here is actually going to show one of those GoPro videos that you've taken, right? Um, for that ID footage. Yeah, yeah. I love that right there. And this one was a curious one. <laughs> That's very curious. That's why I'm glad I'm not holding the camera. 
uh, and it's at the end of a very long pole. And that's a great, it's a great shot. And that's probably the only way you want to see the inside of one of these sharks, um, the mouth at least. So yeah, it's really important that we get good video footage, in particular for uh, a study we're doing on population size. And I say we, but most of that work is being done by Megan Winton, who is uh, finishing her PhD to the School of Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts. And, and uh, having really good underwater footage allows us to uh, differentiate sharks from each other. We can tell who the individuals are. We use that video almost like a like fingerprinting and you know because each shark has its own distinctive color pattern or scar i mean look at this particular shark this is turbo turbo has scars on his nose he's got scars under his right eye you can see there um that's probably from interacting with seals and other sharks but those scars help us differentiate individuals from each other and as a result we've been able to identify you know, well over 300 individual white sharks in this study so far, and we're not even through all the data, all the all the video yet. So, um, getting good underwater footage is not only cool to look at, but it, it really contributes significantly to the science. Great. Um, and let's see some of those other questions then um, that came in. Um, all right. So with the tagging and with this ID, um, you know, some people are looking at, you know, as I said, we've got viewers from Canada. Are some of these sharks then, you know, the ones that they're talking about off of Canada? Or are we talking about different, you know, populations of white sharks? Can you talk about that large scale movement? Absolutely. It's, it's a great question. You know, we tend to focus on white sharks off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts or we'll talk about white sharks that are seen off Canada or off Florida. It's really important for us to, to tell you that it's, it's one population of white sharks in the Western North Atlantic. And that population expands and contracts seasonally. And this is exactly what our, our broad scale tagging data are showing us. You know, Whether you tag a shark off the coast of Florida or off the coast of Cape Cod, it is part of this general population that moves latitudinally. And all that means is it moves north during the warm months. And so it populates areas off Cape Cod, the Gulf of Maine, all the way up to Canada. So we've had a number of our sharks, well over 20 of our sharks move up into Canadian waters. Um, and then as things cool down, you know, they're up there in, in summer and in early fall into mid fall. And as things cool down, that population will contract to their overwintering habitat, which extends basically from North Carolina south uh, into the uh, Florida waters, as well as the Gulf of Mexico. So that's where they overwinter. And then as things warm up again, like right now, as temperatures start to come up, those sharks will begin to move back north. So we have this, you know, this north-south migratory pattern for this, this single population of white sharks on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Very good. All right. And, you know, when we're talking about those ones, it said the eastern coast of the U.S., are these different sharks than say South Africa, California? Can you even talk about that looking at the global range or distribution of white sharks? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I, I could have thrown that in, but yes, we do have distinctive populations. And this has been de demonstrated genetically. There's a lot of folks looking at tissue samples that we collect and others collect uh, to, to get a sense of their molecular structure, their DNA. And that tells us that there are very distinctive populations in, in, in parts of the world. So, you, you know, you turn on Discovery Channel or National Geographic and you'll see white sharks off Mexico or off the coast of California or South Africa or Australia. Those are distinct populations genetically. And there's very little mixing or almost no mixing between these populations. You know, we have those on in the Eastern Pacific and in, in California and Mexico, and, and they mix to some extent. And then we have those off South Africa, and then we have those off the uh, East Coast of the United States. So they are very distinctive populations. But if you and I look at them, they look the same. You know, the shark lo looks like the same species. There's just these really subtle genetic differences. Okay. Um, and so you have, you know, been fortunate to spend a lot of days out on the water with this research project. Again, I want to make sure I reiterate to people at home, the majority of your time is spent at a desk at a computer, but 
during field season. Um, and so we have had a few people actually um, go ahead and ask us about, you know, I think one of the more famous days uh, for you out on the water where a shark actually came up um, and breached right underneath the pulpit. So why don't we go ahead and we'll share this video with everyone at home. <laughs> This so for folks at home who are watching this video right now, it's going to loop. It's going to show from a few different camera angles because the boat is rigged with several different GoPros. And Greg, this video is actually the second time that this happened to you, right? Yeah, yeah. This is the this is our I think it was our last. Look at that. Yeah, this was our last trip on the water in 2019, and and uh, it was late in the season. It was November. Um, and uh, uh, my son Wilson was with me that day, and uh, he got to see a, a white shark charge after his dad um, to some extent. This is the second time. I guess I'm becoming a little bit used to it. But um, in this particular case, uh, the shark was intrigued by the camera on the end of this pole, so it kept chasing my camera. And this was one of those sharks that I think is really charged up and in, in hunting mode, in predatory mode. Um, and, uh, and was really riled up. And, and unlike the first shark that breached at me a couple of years ago, this one didn't come too far out of the water. Um, and I didn't look down its throat into, uh, at its, its wide open jaw, but it, it was still a very frisky shark. And, uh, and one, one that makes me think that uh, at that particular moment, I wouldn't have wanted to be in the water with that fish. Great. Um... <laughs> And again, so that didn't just happen to you once we were out in the field. That actually happened to you on two separate occasions? Yeah, the, f the first time, you know, it's a, a, a video that went viral. Um, I think I want to say it was 2017 or, or maybe 18. These years do blend together. And I guess that's a luxury to be in the water that much and, and not remember exactly the timing of each of these events. But that one, the shark jumped up right under the pulpit and came out of the water and was clearly reacting to the image that it, it interpreted on the surface of the water um, and opened its mouth and I looked down into its mouth and I s thought to myself this was not a very comfortable position to be in um, but luckily the shark really couldn't get to me and uh, you know fell back in the water and swam off and we have seen that shark again and it didn't behave like that again so um, really a, a very rare occurrence, but one that opens your mind, your eyes to the, the, the power of these animals. All right. Um, and we had a question that came in, you know, why white sharks? You know, there are many different species of sharks out there. And have you worked with other species previously? But, you know, what is it that or why is it that white sharks are your focus right now? Well, I think that a lot of people... Uh, especially younger people now see me as a white shark scientist. And, um, and that, and I will tell you that's, you know, over the 30 something years I've been doing this, it, it's a relatively short part of it. Um, I spent a lot of time working on other species of sharks and I still do, you know, I have students that work on, on basking sharks or blue sharks or makos or, or, uh, or Greenland sharks. Uh, you know, I've had, I've had the luxury and the experience of working with sharks not only off the coast of New England for decades, but also in other parts of the world. You know, I love the work we're doing right now on, uh, on tiger sharks in the Caribbean. You know, it's a wonderful place for me to visit <laughs> and uh, add really great fish. And I've got a student, Grace Castleberry at uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who's working on, uh, on those fish in addition to great hammerheads in the Florida Keys. You know, so we have a number of different studies um, right now, we're focusing on white sharks here off Massachusetts because there's so little we know about them. And we, uh, but what we do know is, is they're hunting seals in very close proximity to where people recreate. So we have this overlap between shark predatory behavior and human beings. And, and that's got everybody concerned. I think it's got Cape Cod particularly nervous. And so we're really, really focused on studying white sharks now in that area because we want to learn as much as we can about them so that we can give advice to beach managers and public safety officials and produce the kinds of information that will be useful for them to enhance public safety. Okay. And since, you know, 
for a lot of people, I think that's learning something new in the fact that you work with these other species of shark and that you don't just work here at Massachusetts. Um, so we're getting the question come in now, what is your favorite species of shark? Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pickle uh, shark lover. I, um, I, I have to say, you know, every time I study a shark for the first time, like this, I, I've done a bunch of work with great hammerheads, but I've never really captured them or dove with them like we have over the last year. And they are an amazing species and they're, they've quickly rised, rose up to the top um, but they still have yet to displace the white shark, which um, I've become quite enamored with and have been since I was a kid. You know, the movie Jaws came out and I was fascinated by white sharks, uh, even the plastic one in that movie. And so I am uh, still in love with white sharks. And, 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 I, and the more we learn about them, the more I'm intrigued by them. So, yeah, I've got all these other ones that are creeping up on white sharks. But for now, it's going to stay uh, the great white. All right. And in talking about that, you know, you really just brought up a great point about, you know, being able to be in the water with sharks. Um, and so we often get the question, do I have to be scuba certified to, you know, study sharks or uh, work, you know, in oceanography? Uh, can you talk a bit about maybe some of your experiences diving and then how that is related into your job? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I became enamored with the ocean. Um, like I said, I grew up in Southern Connecticut on Long Island Sound, and, and I've got three sisters that still live in that area, and I visit them quite frequently. And But most of what I, my, my love for the ocean came from watching television. I hate to tell kids that these days, to try to reduce <laughs> screen time. Um, we certainly didn't have the TVs we've got today or the electronics we have today, but we did have uh, great TV shows like uh, like the, the Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau and, uh, and the movies I mentioned and Sea Hunt and others. And I, I thought that was, it'd be really, really cool to have a job working in the ocean. And so I became enamored by it. Um, and I want, decided at an early age, I wanted to be a scuba diver. So I started diving in, in the late seventies um, and I've been diving since. And, I, and, and one aspect that I do love about my job is every now and then um, I do get to go diving with, with sharks and whether it be um, local sharks here or sharks in the tropics. You know, I've done a number of shows for television and a lot of those shows have involved me being in the water with the species that we're working on. And that's been really exciting, you know, diving with um, you know, reef sharks or, or whether it's tigers or hammerheads, you name it. I love doing that. But it's important to realize that you don't need to be a diver to study these fish. You know, at all. I know people that don't dive and, and are fantastic shark scientists. Um, and you don't even necessarily have to work on live sharks. You know, I, that's become a focus of my job the last 10 years. But a lot of my early work uh, was really looking at dead fish, you know, dead sharks. You can learn a lot from a dead shark. Not that I want to promote the killing of sharks, but if a shark is harvested um, for to, to be consumed and it's done legally, you know, scientists uh, still go out and study those fish. You, know, you can learn a lot from the tissues of those fish. Um, and there are shark scientists that almost spend all their time in the lab and not in the field whatsoever. And that's just the, the biologists. You know, you know, you see me on the pulpit of the boat. You got to think in terms of the number of jobs that are behind me, the team that is behind me. Not only John driving the boat, not only... Um, Wayne flying in the air, but somebody built that boat, somebody built that pulpit, somebody built the electronic tags that I'm working on, uh, working with. You know, I work a lot with marine uh, engineers and folks who are specialists in electronics who build the technology that we use. You know, I get all the credit because I'm putting the tag in the shark. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, is there's a whole bunch of people behind me that have made that those tags, that have built the boats and have done all these things that deserve more credit than I do. And so there's so many jobs out there associated with these, these sharks and these species and with the ocean that you don't have to be, you know, pigeonholed into any particular aspect of it. You know, there's so much you can do. All right. And in talking about that, you know, it's great to point out all those other careers. Um, you know, we did just have a question come in as well. Um, that's looking at how you and your career and what you're doing right now, um, how you work with the towns. 
um, or the Cape Cod National Seashore. And you know, you brought up the point before about, you know, and this picture shows where the sharks are swimming and that they're close to recreational swimming beaches. So can you talk a bit about how your research, you know, is then relayed to the towns and what your relationship is with the towns and the people managing these beaches? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's a, um, I think it's really important that we work closely with the towns and other stakeholders like, you know, the National Park Service, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy has done a great job, you know, forging those relationships with us and between towns and bringing the towns together to work together. Um, we're dealing with the overlap of a, a highly predatory species, the white shark, with its prey that you see in this photo, which is primarily gray seals in this area. And these sharks are hunting incredibly shallow water, and these waters have been used by recreational people for a very long time for a number of activities, and it actually draws people to Cape Cod. And so it's really important that we collaborate with the towns and share this information that, so that we can develop policies that will enhance public safety. The towns have also been really instrumental in helping us getting uh, you know, our receivers in the water. You know, we work with almost every town, every coastal town in Massachusetts to do that. You know, when you're putting out 100 receivers, if I can just deliver them to the local harbor masters and beach managers and they put them out for us, it really is quite helpful. We then share those acoustic detection data with those towns so they know when the sharks are there. You know, somebody off up in Situate or Marshfield may have a very different seasonality of an abundance of sharks in their waters than you would off Wellfleet, Furrow, Chatham, Provincetown. So having receivers spread out all over the state and working with these towns is really quite important. And also in terms of educating the public, you know, you'll see on the Cape and other places signs that are out there to tell the folks about the presence of these sharks. You know, you may recall in the movie Jaws that this was not something that was happening. They didn't want to know about the presence of white sharks off their coast. But here on Cape Cod and in Massachusetts, everybody's very forthright about, you know, let's talk about the presence of these animals and let's talk about conducting science that's going to be useful for enhancing public safety. Great. Um, so you really do. Your work is collaborative. You work with a lot of different people, a lot of different entities, organizations, all of that. Yeah, it's critically important. You know, um, we collaborate with, with students and professors at a number of universities as well, uh, all over the US. Um, and a lot of our information is shared with other white shark scientists and we write papers together, um, comparing what happens say off South Africa and California to Cape Cod, you know. It's really important that we have this strong spirit of collaboration and we don't work alone. Um, whether it be with the towns or other scientists, um, it's critically important that information is shared um, because it ultimately leads to, and, and that goes with the public as well, you know, uh, I do events like this because I think it's critically important that the public engage on, on these animals, you know, and I think because of that, really, it leads to conservation and better protection and sustainability of our natural resources. So. You know, it is really critical that, and, it, and it's much easier than it was when I was young, you know. Now we can do this, you know. I couldn't do this when I was a kid, you know. Technology <laughs> and, is great. <laughs> and it really is kind of cool that, you know, I'm, I'm reaching out to a few people tonight and today and, uh, and getting a chance to, to talk about these amazing animals. Great. Um, and looking at, you know, the future of the work that you plan to do or, you know, even things that might not be planned right now, but that you hope, you know, what is the future look like right now for white shark research? And then, you know, everyone has dreams. So what is your dream project, whether it's with white sharks or another species that you hope to work on one day? Well, that's a good one. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of living the dream right now, um, just by doing what we're doing. And, and I'm really focused as is the whole team on an understanding, a really good understanding of the fine scale predatory behavior that's going on right off our shores on Cape Cod. So, you know, uh, using the newer technologies and the technology is changing every year and that's what's really cool. 
you know, um, you know, the, these, these didn't exist when I was a young kid. And so um, now we're strapping them to sharks and we're learning so much about their behavior. So I guess having a really successful three or four years starting, you know, in 2020 and really drilling down deeper in how these sharks behave, you know, from minute to minute to second to second and where they're more most likely and how they're most likely to attack and kill their prey, their natural prey seals is really, really important to me, you know, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting any younger. And so, you know, along those lines, you know, one of the most enjoying parts of my job is, is working with students and, and having them, you know, learn these techniques and, and, and not only learn from me, but I learned from them and, and eventually they're going to replace me. And so, you know, I'm not going anywhere yet, but whether you're a college student or a high schooler or a young kid watching me right now, think in terms of, you know, doing exactly what, if this is what you love, you know, do what I'm doing. You know, you can, you can do this someday and we need you. And we're not going to learn everything there is to know about, you know, these species. There's over 500 species of sharks and we're not going to learn everything there is to know about white sharks. And so I guess my dream is to, um, you know, keep doing what we're doing, use the new technologies that come out and uh, continue to, to educate the youth as they come up and uh, eventually replace me. <laughs> <laughs> we have met a few kids who are planning to take your job when you retire. <laughs> <laughs> I think a couple of them have been lurking in my backyard. <laughs> um, so on that note then, you know, what is your advice for, you know, the next generation of shark scientists? You know, what classes should they be focused on and what things, you know, could they be doing right now, you know, if they're maybe eight or 12 or 15, you know, what could they already get involved in? What's your advice for them? Well, you know, it's, it starts with, with, uh, with reading and understanding these animals. Um, if you're really young, you know, um, I, I think there's a lot to be learned through, through, you know, general shark books and, and even, even some of the documentaries that we see on television, we try to incorporate at least some, level of science you know obviously in school it's great to focus on biology and science but also realize that the other subjects are just as important you know a well-rounded education as you go through elementary school um reading writing which we do a lot of uh mathematics and then as you get into high school obviously an understanding of chemistry and physics uh, and, and advanced biology is all really important. As you, as you advance in high school, you know, volunteering for organizations, you, they don't have to be shark centric organizations, but that would be great, but they can just be, you know, natural resource organizations, conservation organizations. It could be your local, you know, Audubon Society Park. It could be anything, you know, volunteering and working there will get you some level of experience, start building your resume. And as you get into to high school, you know, uh, think about colleges, you know, because, you know, and you don't have to go to a very expensive university that has a big marine biology program, you know. Many of the state schools in your own state provide a really good biology degree and foundation for moving on to graduate school. And, uh, and ultimately that's where the rubber hits the road, you know. And as you advance into high school, you know, the popular literature is great, but getting into the technical peer reviewed publications is also important. You know, I get a lot of um, emails from kids who are super interested in sharks. And then I go back and I ask them, what aspect of sharks do you like? And they say all aspects. And, and that's great. But as you get on in, in high school and you get into the, your undergraduate education at university, you really want to drill down a little deeper into one aspect you might be interested in working on, you know, whether it be morphology, physiology, you know, natural behavior, ecology, um, really look over the literature, published literature and get a sense. And as you get older, drill down deeper into, into the science behind what we do and not just what you see on TV. Very good. That's great advice for everyone. Um, all right, so then our last question is, um, if you can just touch base, you know, hopefully, you know, by the time we get, you know, you said usually things start to kick off around mid-June, um, you know, so if hopefully if we're able to do that, 
you know, what does the research plan look like for this upcoming summer? What are your plans? Well, we've got a number of different aspects, but the focal part of it will be continue to learn more about the nearshore behavior of white sharks. And to do that, we're using a technology that's relatively new called acceleration data loggers. And what those do is they record, we put them on the shark and they record the really, really fine scale movements of these animals over the course of a day or two. And, and so fine scale that every second it's measuring 20 different parameters on the, the movement of that animal, whether the frequency at which it moves its tail, the direction it's going in, whether it changes the angle of its direction, its water depth, the water temperature, really, really fine scale behavioral data that we hope will tell us when, where, and how white sharks are attacking and killing their prey, the, the seals. And, and what's really cool about the technology is each one of these tags also has a camera system built into it. So we can look at the data and compare it to the actual observations coming from the camera on the shark. And we put them on the shark and uh, within a day or two, they, they'll come off, we retrieve the camera, and we look at all the data and we can get a sense of how these sharks behave. And we're gonna continue with our acoustic technology, which will tell us the, the fine and broad scale movements of these sharks. We'll be doing some tissue samplings to look at their reproductive uh, biology and genetics, as well as their, their feeding ecology. So we have a number of different studies going on with collaborators really all over the US. And, uh, and the more I sit in my house, the more I excited I am to get out of here. Awesome. And just one final note, because I think that this, you know, that's a lot that you just explained to everybody. Um, and I think that one of the big misconceptions that we often see is that you're talking about doing all of those projects from this boat right here. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's the, uh, the, the Aleutian dream. John and Pam King's vessel, John's the captain of that, and that is our research platform. And what we're able to do is just from the pulpit of that boat, and we're able to get an amazing amount of information from touching that shark just once. You know, so we'll be able to get a tissue sample, put a tag in, and do all those things uh, to learn all these aspects of the biology of this animal. Awesome. Very good. Um, you know, a lot of people just always like to use that line from Jaws, you know, you're going to need a bigger boat, but it's amazing what you guys are able to accomplish from this boat. And I think it's important to note again, like you said, it's because it's a team effort. It's everyone working together. And, you know, as Bill Belichick would say, doing their job, you know, to make sure you guys can get it done. Yeah, I'm, off, I'm often quoted, uh, I often quote uh, Coach Belichick and I'll uh, say, let's just do our job, you know, and I'm mostly telling myself, you know, instead of <laughs> <our quarters and laughs> I'm telling myself, Greg, focus on your job, you know, let the others do theirs because they do it so well. Um, and the reason we don't need a bigger boat is because these sharks, although you see it on TV and Hollywood likes to portray them as evil, you know, people eating machines, they're not, you know, we don't need a bigger boat, you know, um, we're doing just fine with a small boat and and these sharks are not out to try to get us. Um, they are just doing what they naturally do and just trying to survive. Very good. Well, Dr. Scummel, we can't thank you enough for being with us this morning. This was really great for all of our viewers. Do you have any final notes or anything you want to share and put out there for everyone? Well, I, you know, I want to I want to thank my agency, Division Marine Fisheries, and especially want to thank you know the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Um, they are the, the unsung heroes behind the scenes here, not only facilitating our research by providing the platforms uh, to get it done, the boat, the plane, buying tags, but uh, educating the public being the primary vector that we use to get to you guys out there. So I want to thank the Conservancy and, uh, and thank all of you for your support. If you weren't, you know, uh, donating to the Conservancy, we wouldn't be getting this research done. So. Uh, thanks to everybody out there, all the support over the years, and uh, I really do appreciate it. So stay hunkered down. We're going to get through this. We're going to survive, and we're going to be out on the water in no time. So thank you all. Excellent. That's a great note to end on. So again, thank you so much to Dr. Greg Skomal, you know, our scientist who is here explaining what it is to be a shark scientist, what a day in the life looks like. And um, we want to thank everyone for tuning in with us today for our online enrichment program. We're going to export this video and share it onto our YouTube channel as well. So if you know anyone who missed this interview today, you can share it with them through that. 
Um, and we just want to thank everyone again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Skomal, and we hope everyone has a great day out there. Bye, everybody. Thank you.